Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the first traditional hymns that I ever learned uh, was Onward, Christian Soldiers. I found it in the back of a Gideon Bible in the chapel at Fort Knox where my dad was a chaplain stationed there in the army. And I'm sure that you know it. I actually said to Laura, I should have, when I pivoted on what I was preaching on today, this, I should have changed the hymn. And even at the contemporary service, we could have, we could have done uh, the God of Angel Armies. It would have been a good one for the contemporary service. But, you know, once you go to print, you're kind of stuck with what you got. So, but anyways, you know, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. So is that what we're doing? Are we marching off to war? Throughout the scriptures, there certainly seemed to be an indication of this reality of life in the church militant. And maybe the best example is when Jesus tells the apostle Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I, at the risk of stating the obvious, gates are a defensive weapon, Right? So if the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, that gives us the picture of the church storming the gates of hell. But not in Ephesians 6. In our epistle today, the posture of the Christian soldier is not offensive, but defensive. If we want a picture, Ephesians 6 is less like Joshua and the Israelites rushing into Jericho to burn down the city after the walls fell down. And it's more like the righteous King Hezekiah, who was caged in Jerusalem as the Assyrians laid siege. And what did he do? He went into the temple and he prayed to the Lord and asked and waited for God to do something. See, our marching orders in Ephesians 6 are not about marching at all. Instead, the apostle tells us to do one thing, to stand, to stand. Four times in uh, this passage, he said, tells us to stand. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. In verse 13, he encourages us to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, he says in verse 14. Not charge, not retreat, stand. It reminds me of a scene in a, in a war movie where uh, the, the, the commander of the troops, it's, they're in a fortress, it's, it's, it's a medieval setting, they're being besieged, you know, the battering ram is coming in at the, at the gate, at the door, and he says, no matter what comes through that gate, you will stand your ground. In Exodus 14, the children of Israel are caught between the Egyptian army and the sea, they're caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. And they cry out against God. They cry out against Moses. They wonder, why did the Lord rescue us just to slaughter us on the beach? What is going on? But then Moses gives them a powerful word. And he says, fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord that he will work today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Fear not. Stand firm. And then Moses stretched out his arms. He lifted up the staff that God had given him. And the sea parted. And the Israelites walked through safely on dry ground to the other side. But when the Egyptians tried to pursue them, the waves came back crashing into their place. And they drowned Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. The Lord worked salvation for them because the battle belongs to the Lord. All they had to do was stand. Not only must we be mindful of our orders to stand, but also remember who the enemy is. And it's not other people. Now, I know American culture has changed, and our postmodern relativistic culture has very little love for Orthodox Christianity. We could try to parse all the reasons for that, sociological, political, theological. We could get ourselves worked up by listening to all the talking heads, but the reality remains that our enemies are not human beings, whether they are politicians, the Hollywood elite, 
athletes that refuse to stand, foreign dictators, even Islam. And while it is true that Satan can use wicked people for his purposes, our real enemies are not flesh and blood. The Apostle Paul reminds us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And ever since the serpent slithered into view and tempted Eve to sin and eat the forbidden fruit, we have been in a pitched battle against the hordes of hell. Unfortunately, most people, including Christians today, don't think the devil is real. According to the Barna Group and research that they did, only a third, well, a little bit more than a third, 35%, only 35% of American Christians believe that the devil is an actual entity. And yet the devil and his minions are real. Paul calls them rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In another of his epistles, the, the apostle refers to the devil as the prince of the power of the air. This present darkness is a spiritual threat. The demons continually assault our consciences with temptations, with guilt, with fear, with despair. The name Satan, Satan in Hebrew, the Satan means accuser. And that's what Satan does. He accuses our conscience. At one time, he tried to accuse our consciences before God, like he, like accusing us before God, like he did with Job. But ever since the death and resurrection of Jesus, Satan has been cast out of heaven. He can no longer enter into the, 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 the Lord's heavenly courts. But he still accuses our consciences by day and night inside of our own hearts. And he's ruthless. The Apostle Peter says that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. To that end, the Apostle Paul says, keep alert with perseverance and stand. Peter says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stand your ground, no matter what comes through those gates. Against this fearsome enemy, it might appear that we're mercilessly outmatched. But the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Do you know that one, Romans 8? If God is for us, who can be against us? Satan may have his demon hordes, but we have the God of angel armies on our side. And I'm reminded of this battle in 2 Kings chapter 6, a passage where the king of Israel, we read this a uh, month or so ago in our adult Bible class, but the king of Israel is trembling in fear as he looks at all of the Syrian armies arrayed against him, not us Syrian, that's later in 2 Kings, but Syrian armies arrayed against him. And the servant of the prophet Elisha is also afraid. He's also trembling and Elisha encourages him. He says, do not fear, because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. And then Elisha prays that the Lord would open the eyes of his servant to, to this reality. And the Lord truly opens his eyes because then he sees all around on the mountainside with him, with them, the chariots and horses of fire of the armies of God all around them. And then the Lord strikes the Syrian army with blindness so that they can't fight at all. It's no good. And the Lord delivers Israel that day. Jesus also does not leave us alone on the field of battle. Those with us are greater than those that are with them. And he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And Jesus arms us with the very best weapons of war, the whole panoply, that's the Greek word. 
And the armor of God is how we often translate that, the whole armor of God. St. Paul writes, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and above all, to stand firm. So let's take an inventory of our equipment. First, there is the belt of truth. God's word is truth. Jesus Christ calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. And when we believe in Christ and stand in his truth, and not the world's ways, and not the opinions of people, when we stand in his truth, we stand firm. Next is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, when I was a kid, I thought that uh, this righteousness meant doing good things, being a good person, and that the way that we protect our heart is by that kind of active righteousness of good works. But that's not what the apostle is talking about here. This is the passive righteousness of faith. This is the gift of faith that, yes, is certainly evidenced in the good works that we carry out in Christ, but ultimately it is the faith that clings to Christ and by which we are justified. Now, it's hard for us to see this in English, but the word for righteousness and the word for justification are related. Now, it's, it's, it's obvious in Greek and in Latin, in both of those biblical languages, uh, the, these words sound and look alike. And so to be justified means to be declared righteous, to be made right, made righteous with God. And we believe that we are justified, we are made righteous by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works of the law. Paul says, by grace, this is Ephesians 2, earlier in the book, by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And so this breastplate of righteousness that guards our heart is the righteousness of faith that Christ won for us and delivered to us. It's not what we do for ourselves. The next pieces of armor are the gospel shoes, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And the gospel is the good news that our sins are forgiven and that we are accepted before God, not because of anything that we've done or haven't done, but because of what Christ did on the cross for us and because Jesus loves us and died for us. And so when the devil comes against us, we are fleet of foot because of our hope in the gospel. Our greatest defense, though, is the shield of faith. Faith, I already said, is a gift from God, and faith clings to the promises of God. It believes and receives his forgiveness. And when the devil is at his worst, launching his attacks at you, his temptations, the trials, the doubts, your faith in Christ will give you hope even when hope seems lost. Paul says that with the shield of faith, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. The King James says, all the fiery darts. And uh, some of you may remember Pastor Glenn Kaltoff. He was the, the, uh, the vacancy pastor uh, before me here. He once told me a funny story that will help you remember this passage of Scripture. He said that one time he was reading it, he got kind of tripped, you know, old days, King James only days. He got tripped up and he got the initial consonants wrong. And, and instead of fiery darts, he said diary farts. <laughs> and hopefully the Lord protects you from those too. <laughs> but the point is that the devil doesn't have anything on you with that shield of faith. And then we receive the helmet of salvation that protects our head. We've been saved by Christ. We've been saved in Christ. And according to the Apostle Paul, we have been given the mind of Christ. So that the things that we think about the thi are the things above where Christ is instead of the things that are below. And when we are met with attacks, we can boldly say, but I belong to Jesus. I am saved I am baptized. I belong to Christ. Those are the things upon which we meditate. 
And finally, we come to our last weapon, the only offensive weapon, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, in the picture that, that Lisa had, that sword was actually a little bit too long. Roman soldiers didn't have long swords and broad swords like in medieval warfare. They had a gladius that was only, you know, the word gladiator. They had a gladius. It was only about 18 inches long, about the same length as from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. Um, and actually, in a lot of ways, you know, I've heard sermons and I've read commentaries. Scholars are divided on this as to whether, because of course, we, you know, was you there, Charlie, when the Romans fought? You know, were you there? Did you see? Archaeologists and historians believe the primary weapon of the Roman legions was a spear. And the gladius was only sort of a matter of last resort when you got, got into really close combat so that when you would have your shield up, and for us, our shield of faith, you could make short, fast thrusts with the gladius. But it wasn't their primary weapon. But even so, like I say, whether Paul has in mind the gladius or some, some other sword is, is up for debate. But here's, here's the reality, though. The, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And in Hebrews 4, we read that the, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting to the, the separation of spirit from soul. I don't know which, is it, can anybody here explain to me what is the difference between your spirit and your soul? I certainly cannot, but that is a distinction that the Word of God makes, and that the Word of God can distinguish. That is a very, very sharp distinction. And in the book of Revelation, we're told that God's Word is like, this is Revelation 19, where we see Jesus as the great champion on the white horse, coming with the angel armies on the last day, that the word of God comes out of his mouth like a sword as he makes war on his enemies, which are sin, death, and the devil, the beast, the false prophet. And that same powerful word has been entrusted to us. It points us to Christ, who is our hero and the defender of our faith. And he alone died to save us from sin, from death, from the devil. He alone conquered our enemies by his glorious death and resurrection. And this armor, these, these weapons that Christ gives us are all gifts. All gifts that we do not earn or win or buy. They are ours by right of our baptism and our faith in Christ. In fact, the very language of putting on the armor of God that is here is, is a verb that in elsewhere in the New Testament usually refers to getting dressed, to being clothed, like earlier in Ephesians 4, where it says that we are clothed with Christ. We have put on Christ instead of our old Adam. So we are clothed with Christ, and he clothes us with his armor, with these weapons. We are clothed with Christ, our one defense, our righteousness. And we're covered with prayer. We stand firm against the devil and his schemes because Christ has girded us. And the only reason that we can stand against the devil is because Christ stands before us and with us and behind us. And Christ took his ultimate stand on the hill of Calvary where he died on the cross. And because of that death and that glorious resurrection, the devil is defeated. As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. The victory is done. The battle is won. And so we can be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. His might, not ours. If we try to stand in our own strength, we fall. But if we stand in the strength of his might, we withstand in the evil day. Thanks be to God. In Jesus' name, amen.